Greetings to all of God's people who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We as your pastors are sending these messages to you much like the apostles did in the New Testament. When they sent letters back to the churches, we pray that these messages will encourage, exhort, empower, and help you to tell others the good news of our Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. Today is Palm Sunday, and I've asked Pastor Dan if he would teach us the importance of this holiday for God's people. I know that you will be blessed by the ministry of God's word today. Good morning and happy Palm Sunday. This morning I'd like to share some insights into Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem that we typically refer to as Palm Sunday. And as many of you know, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all give different perspectives of what happened in the events that uh, are recorded in the Bible. So when Jesus came into Jerusalem that Sunday 2,000 years ago, each one, Matthew, shares his perspective of what happened. Mark, Luke, and John all do the same. And so to get a more complete picture of what happened on that Palm Sunday, what I've done is compiled all the gospel accounts together in what is called a gospel harmony. So this morning, as you see on your screens, you will see the words in black come from Matthew's account in chapter 21, but there will also be some words that are in red. That is material that comes from Mark chapter 11. The words that you see in blue come from Luke's account in chapter 19. And then finally, the words that are in green are in the Gospel of John chapter 12. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent to two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her, on which no one has ever sat. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, why are you doing this? You shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, and they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. They brought the donkey and the colt to Jesus and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. The large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut leafy branches from the palm trees that they had cut from the fields, and went out to meet him and spread them on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him.
the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. So in this account that's recorded in all four Gospels, Jesus and his disciples are on their way up to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, like thousands of other Jews. And we know from Mark chapter 10 that Jesus and his disciples were coming to Jerusalem from Jericho, where Jesus had just healed, for example, the blind man named Bartimaeus on the way out of town. Well, Jericho is about 15 miles east of Jerusalem. And when you leave Jericho, you go up, literally. When we say go up to Jerusalem, the ascent rises about 3,200 feet. And which, by the way, is the reason why Psalms 120 through 134 are called the Psalms of Ascent because literally as pilgrims the Jews would make their way up to Jerusalem they would be going up the hill to Jerusalem and they would sing those particular psalms on their way up to Jerusalem. Well an experienced traveler could make that trip from Jericho to Jerusalem in about eight hours by foot. This is a Roman road and it ascends as you get closer and closer to Jerusalem, eventually to the Mount of Olives, which stands directly opposite the Jewish temple in Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley. And by the way, this is in fact the same road that Jesus is talking about when he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, when you read Mark's account of Jesus' triumphal entry, and you look at this map, from Jericho to Jerusalem, you might wonder why Mark in particular mentions Bethany, because typically the road from Jer Jericho to Jerusalem did not go through Bethany, but rather through Bethphage. The Gospel of John, however, tells us why Bethany is mentioned in his account, because Jesus and his disciples actually spent the night in Bethany on their way to Jerusalem because that's the home of Mary and Martha, Martha and Lazarus. And if you remember, Lazarus was the one that Jesus had raised from the dead just shortly before Jesus's triumphal entry. Jesus most likely would have started out from Jericho early in the morning and then would have made his way to Bethany and would have got there by late afternoon or early evening probably had dinner with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, which is not recorded, and stayed overnight with, uh, with them, with his friends, and then went on his way to Jerusalem, which would then be on Sunday morning. John tells us that the crowds were already coming out to Bethany to greet Jesus, uh, even before he got to Jerusalem, because they were so excited. They had heard that he was coming, and of course the raising of Lazarus from the dead made Jesus even more of a well-known figure in that region. And not only the people who were coming to welcome him were excited, but as we know, the Pharisees and those who were against Jesus were also very interested in Jesus' arrival because they were going to seize this opportunity to uh, take him and uh, take him to jail and put him to death. When you read the first several verses of Matthew's account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, and especially when you read Mark's account, you see that there is quite a lengthy description of what was involved in getting a donkey for Jesus to ride. Now, you might ask yourself, so why is there so much interest in Jesus finding a donkey to ride into Jerusalem? After all, the big deal is the triumphal entry, right? Well, for Mark to go into such detail, it would seem clear that he wants us to note something about Jesus. Now, namely, that Jesus was displaying his foreknowledge about these specific events. 
somebody might think, well, maybe Jesus made prior arrangements for a, a donkey and he could ride into Jerusalem that way. But that would be missing the point of what Mark is teaching us, namely that Jesus knew what was coming and he had full control of his situation leading up to his death. Mark wants us to see that Jesus was not the victim of unfortunate circumstances in Jerusalem, but rather he was the master of his life and the master of his, his fate as he chose to go to Jerusalem. So what is the big deal after all about Jesus riding on a donkey and then riding into the Mount of Olives and down uh, from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem? Well, by the way, this is the only instance recorded in scripture where Jesus is said to be riding on an animal. So after a 30 mile journey from Jericho to Jerusalem, it doesn't appear that Mark by any means is saying, well, Jesus got tired and so he wanted to ride the last couple of miles into Jerusalem. Mark wants us to know, no, he walked that way and deliberately said, at this point, two miles outside of town, I am going to get on a donkey and make my entrance into Jerusalem. And the reason why, of course, is because the road was lined with lots of people coming into Jerusalem for Passover. They would typically walk, many of them barefoot, but Jesus is saying, at this point, I need to ride, and why? The answer is Jesus was fulfilling prophecy as found in the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 to 11, 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus knew very well that he was fulfilling prophecy, that he was Israel's coming king who was going to restore the throne of his father, David. Now, Jesus is by this act deliberately claiming to be the promised king of Israel, ready to receive the throne of David. His action is like a living parable as he comes into Jerusalem to disclose his true identity. The triumphal entry shows Jesus's proclamation that he was in fact the Messiah. He identified himself as the shepherd king that was foretold by Zechariah. Now, many were probably in Jerusalem very excited about the possibility that Jesus was going to be a political Messiah who would overthrow Roman tyranny and set up his kingdom here on earth. But this is contrasted by the gentleness and the humility and the servanthood that is symbolized by his arrival on a donkey, on a colt. And this point was not lost on the crowd. Jesus entered Jerusalem to a throng of people who began to spread out their cloaks, Scripture says, spreading them out on the road for Jesus to ride over. Now, we usually think of palms on this day, which is why we call it Palm Sunday. And they were also very significant, just as the cloaks were as they spread them out before Jesus. Palms were also a sign of welcome for a dignitary or someone very special when they came to town. Kind of similar to what we might say today is rolling out the red carpet. We see an example of this, for example, in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13, when Jehu was anointed king over Israel. But today, we think of this as Palm Sunday. And this is because, as John tells us, the Jews cut palm branches and other leafy plants and they spread them out over the road as Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day. And not only on this day, but it was typical on other special celebrations and festivals. Here, however, 
they became symbols of their praise as they waved their branches and strewed them in Jesus' path. And the people began to shout, Hosanna, a Hebrew word, Hoshiana, which literally means save us. And that's exactly what the people needed. They might have been shouting, save us from Roman tyranny, but how beautiful and ironic those words are that here they are saying, Lord Jesus, save us. They needed salvation from their sins far more than they needed salvation from a Roman Caesar. But Hosanna had become a, a part of Jewish celebration. It was a shout of praise that, that one might shout out at a time of, of spiritual uh, excitement in the presence of God. And not only did they say Hosanna, but they shouted out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, showing prophetically, quoting from scriptures, from Psalm 118, verse 26, saying, Jesus, we acknowledge you as our Messiah, as our King, as the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the last, by the way, Psalm 118 is the last of what are called the Hallel Psalms. Hallel meaning praise, Psalms of praise. And people often would sing them at the end of Passover and at other feasts. They also shouted Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is, he, is the coming kingdom of our father David. And by acknowledging David, they were also acknowledging that Jesus was the rightful heir to, to David's throne. You know, it's also interesting that Matthew chapter 21, verse 10, says that Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem caused the whole city to be shaken. And this is a really interesting uh, word in the original language in Greek because it says that literally it was saiste or saiste, which is the root that we get our word like seismology or a seismograph. Jesus's arrival in Jerusalem was literally a seismic event that this was the first of many shakings that would take place over the course of this coming week for the people of Jerusalem. Well, verse 11 says that the people also referred to Jesus as coming from Nazareth. Now, that per se would not have impressed the crowds all that much. If you remember, for example, uh, when Jesus was calling his disciples in John chapter 1, verse 46, uh, Nathaniel commented, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Well, what's so particularly earth-shaking about uh, Jesus coming from Nazareth? Well, what is of seismic proportion in this context is that Jesus was the prophet, and by saying the prophet, what does that mean? Again, the gospel writers see that Jesus is fulfilling scripture, going all the way back to the books of Moses, going back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. We read these words, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. A prophet, the prophet. The Jews in Jesus' day believed that this was a prophecy of Moses, that one day the prophet would come and establish his kingdom on earth. And by proclaiming that the prophet had come from Nazareth, the people were saying, Jesus is the Messiah. You see, the crowd thought that at last, God's anointed king had come, the teacher and the miracle worker from Nazareth, who would overthrow the pagan rulers of Israel and establish God's true kingdom here on earth, not centered in Rome, but in Jerusalem. And so amid the shouting and the singing and the praises, 
Jesus rides through the eastern gate of Jerusalem into the temple area and all of the excitement was building. And then what does Jesus do? But nothing. <laughs> he, he doesn't do anything. In the accounts of Matthew and Luke, the story continues to Jesus cleansing the temple. But if we read in the Gospel of Mark, we see that it says that he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, in other words, late Sunday night, he went out to Bethany, where he was staying, with the twelve. So Jesus went into Jerusalem with all the excitement of people greeting him, went to the temple, Probably many people were expecting him to establish his kingdom and declare himself as Messiah. And then he turned around and went back to Bethany. And there were probably a few people that were a little disillusioned and disappointed. Really? That's all that's going to happen? Well, talk about an anticlimax. Jesus doesn't cleanse the temple, at least right away. And he doesn't lead the crowd into a mob against the Romans. He doesn't even give a stirring speech that, that Sunday evening. He just looks around and leaves. What a disappointment. What kind of Messiah is this? Well, of course, Jesus eventually did cleanse the temple, but he didn't raise a finger against the Romans. In fact, he didn't even raise his voice against them. Instead, he said, render to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God's. In the minds of some of the people of Jerusalem, they might well have gone home and said, who needs a king like this? In fact, by Friday, enough of that multitude that was so filled with excitement and praise was sufficiently disillusioned that at the urging of the priests and the Pharisees who had arranged his arrest and delivered him to the Romans on the charge of being the king of the Jews, he, they were able to turn the people against him. And some of those people who chanted and cried out, Hosanna, save us, were the same people who were saying, crucify him. Well, what lessons can we learn from today's story about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem? Well, first of all, Jesus is our Lord. The crucifixion of Jesus was not an accident that surprised Jesus when he happened to go to Jerusalem at just the wrong time. Rather, Jesus understood and embraced his calling to be the true Messiah for his people. Jesus was about to undergo an excruciating death. He knew his calling and he openly announced his role as he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He didn't hide, he didn't go in secret, but he proclaimed knowing full well what was about to take place. Throughout this process, he demonstrated his foreknowledge of the events of the coming week. From his arrangements with the donkey, his arrangements for the Last Supper with his disciples in the upper room, when he announced that Judas would betray him, when he announced Peter's threefold denial of him, when the disciples were going to desert him, his scourging, his execution. Jesus told all of this in advance. He was in complete control and knowledge of what his fate was. He thereby showed himself as Lord over history and Lord over us. Well, the second point that I'd like to make is that Jesus is our leader. And this is very much related to the first point that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is our leader and we are his followers. 
The problem is sometimes we often get it reversed, don't we? God doesn't always meet our expectations, and when that happens, we find ourselves liking to take the lead. The Jews were expecting a king who would overthrow the Romans. Maybe he'd be a great military leader, one who would establish God's kingdom by force. And when we read of some of the Old Testament prophecies, we can probably understand a little bit why some of the people had these expectations. But Jesus was radically different than the expectations of the people of Jerusalem that Sunday. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he did not do so on a horse, a symbol of warfare and the choice of conquerors, but rather he chose a donkey, a lowly symbol of humility on a beast of burden. The kingdom of God that Jesus preached was not an earthly political kingdom, but a rule of God in people's hearts. People who wanted to love him, to have a relationship with him, to know him personally. This was not the kind of kingdom which the people unfortunately expected, nor some of them even wanted, and they rejected Jesus as Lord. You know, I think sometimes today in our own lives, We've all encountered situations in which sometimes God does not fulfill our personal expectations in a certain situation. What about the person who dearly wants to be married and God doesn't bring the right person into their life? Maybe there's a person who's been passed over time and time again for a particular job or a promotion at work, or maybe there's illness or tragedy that is struck in your family in a very unexpected way, and we struggle with knowing why. And I think the temptation in all of these situations is to take away Jesus's authority and leadership in our lives and say, Lord, if, 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 if you're not going to do anything, I'm going to take control of the situation. I don't trust you enough to truly be in the lead in my life. And so what about that person who wants to be married? Maybe they choose to take control over their lives and end up marrying a non-believer just so that they can be married and find what they think will bring happiness. Or what about the person who doesn't get the promotion and grows resentful or, or bitter over the situation and no longer trusts God to provide for their needs? Or what about the people who are expecting Jesus to bring healing in a certain circumstance or a tragedy strikes and they become disillusioned when God doesn't do things exactly the way they wanted? But again, that takes us back to our first lesson. Jesus is Lord. He's under no obligation to live up to my or your personal expectations. If he chooses to allow disappointment or sorrow to come into our lives, he's still Lord. He doesn't have to fit our expectations of who he is. Christ never promised his followers a life free from pain. The disciple is not above his master, and Jesus chose a path of taking up his cross to fulfill God's plan for his life. You know, Jesus called us to do the same to take up our cross daily and choose to follow him, no matter the circumstances, no matter the hardship or the suffering. Jesus said, allow me to be the leader and I will take care 
of the rest of the circumstances. We must not be like the people of Jerusalem who proclaimed Christ as their king so long as he fit their image of who he was going to be. We must acknowledge him as Lord, Lord over every aspect of our lives and allow him to be our leader. Well, finally, I'd like for us to recognize that Jesus is our lamb. Jesus's entry into Jerusalem coincided sovereignly with the traditional selection and entry of the lambs into Jerusalem. And I think this is just a, an amazing point. This is not coincidence that on the Sunday before Passover took place is when the sacrificial lambs were brought into Jerusalem. In fact, Exodus chapter 12, verse 3 states, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of the month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. Well, that was on the tenth day of the Jewish month of Nisan, which would have been a Sunday, in preparation for the 15th day of Nisan, Friday, which was Passover. And this is the amazing thing. Guess where the Passover lambs came from? It was Jewish tradition in that day that the Passover lambs were brought in from the little village of Bethlehem. The Passover lamb, Jesus, who came into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday was the lamb who was born in Bethlehem, born to become the king, born to be our savior and to take our sins upon himself. Our sacrificial lamb was born. Remember that awesome prophecy that John the Baptist uttered. When Jesus was coming to him at the beginning of his ministry to be baptized, John the Baptist saw him coming and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How perfectly orchestrated was Jesus' entry into Jerusalem that Sunday. Only a sovereign God could bring all of these elements together so perfectly. And how beautiful it is that Jesus is our Lord, our leader, and our Lamb.